Welcome back fellow Ashen Wands to another episode of Painting the Models from Dark Souls. Today is a very special one for me as not only is it one of my favourite bosses ever but also it is the biggest model I have printed to date. It is the one and only Yorm. So let's jump in and get painting this mammoth model. And engage in jolly cooperation. Guys, Hay Fever season is here, so if I sound a bit bunged up, apologies, I am a really bad sufferer. I will try and get through this without sneezing, but we'll see how it goes. So here he is, standing 30 centimeters tall on my desk. Just look at the size of him. As you can see with these white and green bits, I've had to fill in some areas that didn't print 100% perfectly, much like last episode with the mausoleum. So I just used some milliput for larger areas and green putty for finer details to fill in. We'll also need to sand down some of the marks left over from the printing supports, so I'll begin by using some 120 grit sandpaper and just refining some of the rough edges. Now this model has basically been my Everest. I upgraded from my first ever 3D printer, which was an Elegu Mars Pro, and I upgraded to an Anycubic Mono X, literally just to print this model this size. But the knowledge skill set jump between an Elegu Mars and a Mono X is quite big, and I underestimated it. So I dived in with this massive model and it basically broke my printer and caused a lot of issues and I had to wait weeks and weeks for replacement parts and had to repair the printer by hand. So once I got it back up and running, Yorm was my main mission to complete. With this one I thought I'd show you what I do to prime my models. I do it outside on a table as I don't have any space indoors to do it and you need to have a well ventilated area to be doing this in. I want to be making a transition between light and dark because my plan is to use contrast paints and they react differently depending on what primer you're using. So with some grey sear spray, I'm coating the whole top half of the model. The purpose of priming is to completely cover your model which acts as a more adhesive surface for acrylic paints to set on. Now with some Chaos Black Primer, I'll be coating the whole bottom half and the undersides. It's not massively necessary to be using different primers, but I like to use different variations and see what works best. It also gives me a better idea of the highlights and shadows on the model. Now that he's primed and ready to go, I'm going to be taking on the daunting task of painting him. Up till now I've been pretty apprehensive on painting him, simply because he took so long to print and I don't want that to go to waste on a dodgy paint job. He's so big he barely fits within the frame. Now to line up the paints. I have a feeling I'm going to be utilising a lot of the Basilicanum grey. Basilicanum? 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 Don't know how to say that, but Basilicanum grey contrast paint with this model. It's a brilliant contrast paint this one, it really gets stuck into the cracks and dips and creates some awesome shadows. So I'm going to start by applying some of it to his shoulder plates, making sure to get a good coating as the base across all of his armour to which we can add all manner of highlights and other stuff to. I'll also be coating the machete blade with it and seeing how it reacts to the different primers. For his chainmail around his head and upper arms, I'm going to start with a base of Iron Warriors. With his armour painted, I'm moving on to his arms. It's old charred skin, so I'm starting off with a base of Mechanicus Standard Grey, to which, if I'm feeling confident enough, I'll try and add some embers or fire effects to it later on. For his cape and other leather parts, I'm going to do what I always do. Wax some Rhinox Hide, Mornfang Brown and Catkin Flesh onto a wet palette. Starting with just some thinned down Rhinox Hide, I'll be applying a first coat all over his cape. What I found doing it this way by using a paintbrush was that it took so long. His cape is so fiddly and there are so many different hanging parts, it became such a hassle to make sure all the parts both underneath and on top were fully coated. That's not even taking into account the lower half of the model I have to paint as well. So I decided today was the day I would crack out the airbrush. I don't have much experience with this tool so fingers crossed we get it working. But because I'm impatient and this model is massive I decided let's give it a go. Now this is the Fender kit which you can buy on Amazon and it comes complete with an air compressor and an airbrush along with some other handy bits for cleaning as well. 
So I'll begin by popping in some of the Catacan flesh into the paint cup in the top here and adding in some airbrush paint thinner. You need to be using paint thinner with your paints in an airbrush so that the paint can actually flow through the airbrush and out through the end of the needle. Ratios of paint to thinner is usually around one to one, but it does differ depending on the type of paint as they differ in thickness. So it's just a case of experimenting. You want to avoid any excess spatter which can come from paint being too thin. No hesitation, we're just gonna dive in and see how it goes. I'm gonna start by putting a coat of Catacan flesh over the cape, making sure I'm covering all areas of it. Now to start creating some of the highlights, I'm gonna add some lighter tones of Mournfang Brown mixed into the cup with some more paint thinner. By popping my finger on the end here and pulling the trigger back, will create a blowback effect, which mixes the paint together well. From a high angle, I'll be applying the lighter shades to the higher areas to create the illusion of light hitting the cape. The Fender is an okay starter airbrush kit. The airbrush isn't the most advanced in the world, but it's good for something to learn with before spending hundreds of pounds, dollars, euros on a more professional one. I think I overdid it with adding the highlights, such as the way. So I'm gonna add in some Abaddon Black to make a much darker brown and go back over the lower areas to bring out the shadows and create a sharper contrast. So now just repeat the process across the skirt, kilt, what would you call that? Also across his sandals as well. Your wet sandals, guys. I'm making sure to bring the airbrush closer to the model for the areas that need more precision and you can allow yourself to be further away for areas that require wider coverage and less detail. It's just a balancing game of keeping your paints correctly thinned so as not to create an annoying splatter effect, which sadly happened to me multiple times in this video. It's good to use some cardboard to spray on first before applying, just so you can figure out the density of the paint and if it's too thin or not. Now that I'm done with the leather parts, I need to do a quick colour change. I'm going to leave a link on the screen to a helpful video about airbrush quick colour changing. But essentially I'm washing out the cup with water and dumping it into a waste cup. Then with the blowback technique, just adding in airbrush cleaner and water, rinse and repeat a couple of times, and stick the airbrush into one of these cheap handy airbrush cleaner pots and spray out the leftover liquid. And now you're ready for the next batch of colour. I'm also going to be going back over your skin because I didn't get a good first coat earlier so I'm just going to redo it with the airbrush. Is it defeating the point of my different colour primers? Potentially yes. I'll also be adding in some highlights with Ministratum Grey and applying the same process of this to his legs. With that done I'm going to cover up his armour parts with the masking tape. Probably should have done it earlier but we got away with it. This is just so that no spray accidentally gets on parts that it shouldn't. Mixing in some Abaddon Black again to the Eshin Grey, I now spray on some shadows to his arms and legs. Now it's a good thing we put on the masking tape when we did, because next up is the tricky part. I'm going to try and create a fire or flame effect on his arms. So to start this process, I'll be spraying on some Corex White to areas of his arms and to the lip of the armour on his arms. This creates a halo effect that we can start adding colour to. I've seen many different methods online of how people approach this, and one of them is with using contrast paints, as they act well to stain on the white halo that we've made. So with some flesh terrors, terrors, terrors? Flesh terrors red, mixed with some contrast medium, which basically acts as a contrast thinner, I'll be going over the white areas and colouring them in red. Then, with a smaller area within the red that we've created, repeat the process with the Corax White, to which we will be applying a layer of Griff Hound Orange Contrast to. I think I went a tad overboard here with the white, which seems to be the way today. So, with a wider area of red and a more concentrated area of orange, we should start to see a fire effect starting to hot up on his arms here. Back to Corax White again, and apply an even smaller white halo effect on the top of the orange. With this, we should have a much smaller area to work with to add our last colour to. 
we will be adding a layer of Eandon yellow contrast to the last white halo area, which, fingers crossed, should leave us with a pretty hot looking fire effect on his arms. To add some more of the charred look back into certain areas to bring in some of the contrast to the fire, I'm going to be reapplying some of the Basilican Grey to parts of his arms with a thin brush. With that done, I'm going to take a break. With a quick shirt change, we're ready to carry on. I'm going to dry brush on some highlights to the torso underneath the chest armour, which is an area I couldn't reach with the airbrush. So with some administratum grey and a small dry brush, I'm going to lightly brush on some highlights. You'll notice some gold on the decor of his belt here, which I dry brushed on earlier, but forgot to film. Typical. You'll see I sprayed some yellow across the leather over his chest plate to see if I could get a good reflection of the flame. But I wasn't overly thrilled with how it came out, so I'm just going to paint over it with some Rhinox Hide. Nothing's perfect first time, so it's always good that we can go back and fix any problems as we go. Just going to touch up his sandals while I'm at it. Not in a weird way. Now with a small layer brush and some Mornfang Brown, I'm going to colour in the small details of the leather, including the straps on the side as you can see here. I'm going to go around and edge highlight any edges of the leather that stick out to distinguish them from the rest of the area. So just very lightly and gently using the side of the brush to apply a very thin layer of lighter browns to really bring out some of the highlights. With that sorted, I'm moving back onto the machete. The ropes and cloth wrapped around the weapon can be coloured in using some skeleton horde contrast paint. I love this stuff. The more layers of this contrast paint you stack up, the more colour and shade will be added. So I'm going to use this to create some darker and lighter areas. I'm painting the top of the machete handle now with some Canoptec alloy to give it a brown metallic shade rather than silver. I'm also going to be adding in some Rune Lord brass lower down on the handle to give some brassy tones. Now with a 50-50 mix of Basilicanum Grey and Contrast Medium, I'm going to give a wash over the chainmail to make sure it really sinks into the gaps and gives good coverage and shade. To paint the inside of his head, I'm using straight Abaddon Black and then thinning it out to a glaze to wash over the shadow areas on the outside of the head. For his crown, I'm using some Lead Belcher as it's a nice silvery tone and lighter than Iron Warriors so it will stand out from the chainmail. Moving down to his toes, stop being weird, I'm going to add some lighter administratum grey to add in some detail, highlights and his toenails. That done, the main part of the model is complete and we can finish off with the base. I'm applying a layer of Wraithbone to the skulls which will act as a base for the contrast paint to sit on. I'm then applying a thin dry brush layer of Rhinox Hide to the larger rocks for some interest and on top of that adding some Dawnstone, topped off with a layer of Longbeard Grey to accentuate the edges. Now I'm adding Skeleton Horde to the skulls which have the Wraithbone applied to them and this will give a great bone colour. To finally finish off this model, I'm just going to paint around the edges of the base with some Abaddon Black to tidy it up. And it is complete. So now just putting the last of my paints away and ah, I broke it. Oh, can you believe it? Right at the end. That is infuriating. Yeah. You couldn't write it. You couldn't write it. <sighs> Guess I've got to nip off and get some super glue. Just gonna gently reattach it. There we go. Now it's complete. Be careful leaving the frame this time. Well, that's it, everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Painting the Giant Yorm. If you did, please be sure to drop a like, leave a comment and hit that subscribe button. I'm going to try and get over this hay fever before I record next episode. But until then, stay hollow gang.